Welcome everyone uh, with this uh, Veeam Partner Academy uh, starters edition, let's say. Um, um, Stan will be the one who will start with a, a, a platform overview of a product portfolio overview of uh, the Veeam solution. And afterwards, I will talk uh, some more about the, the licensing and the Veeam universal licensing in particular uh, afterwards. But uh, Stan, I would say uh, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, there, she noticed my message. Thank you again. Uh, so I'll start sharing the screen. There you go. And one, two, three, share. So everything is visible now. Normally it's jumping into presenter mode. Still visible and hearable. Everything yes. okay? Okay, thank yes. you. So hello again. Uh, my name is uh, Stan Marywood. Uh, for a lot of you, uh, not a big surprise. Still working at Veen. Um, and I make part of the Bach team, actually. And sounds like a, a very special uh, musician, and it is indeed, but uh, actually it's a complete region uh, where all the SEs are gathered together. Um, more info, click the link or afterwards uh, through the presentation. So we only have one topic for today, I, at least I have. Huh? Next thing is for Thierry, at least. Um, this will be generally the overview uh, what we are going to do today. So this is the result of everything. It looks like a big mess and it is indeed, but we start step by step and everything will grow and grow. And in the end, normally we should come up with something that looks like this. So for me as well, it's going to be uh, pretty exciting to, to get over here. Huh? Now, let's first talk a little bit about Veeam, Veeam in general. Well, Veeam is a little bit more than just a solution that can take backups because in the early days indeed it started off with a backup solution or actually a monitoring solution and then afterwards a backup solution not a lot of people do know that and nowadays it's a lot more than just taking a backup of vmware we do vmware hyper v nutanix and very soon as well red hat uh, hypervisor on premises and we have on the right top, we have something as well that's being called the cloud. We do a lot of things with the cloud and that part is only growing. Why? We see a hybrid transition towards cloud. Still the main message, and perhaps uh, this is the wrong focus of, of the audience then, because uh, there are only partners in there. What we see generally in the field is that a lot of clients jump into the cloud, just like that cloud first strategy, copy paste, and then they come back pretty fast as well, just as fast as they migrated. So keep that in mind, do a transition is first, think about it, then plan it, then do it, and then stick to the things that are pretty good in the cloud and uh, make use of all the application and services over there that are difficult to do better uh, on premise. We also have plenty of things um, against ransomware. This is being yeah, the, the terrific um, excuse to, to make um, people and clients uh, afraid of uh, plenty of uh, things uh, that are wandering around in the, on the internet nowadays. However, keep in mind ransomware is indeed, there are plenty of ransomware attacks, but we can protect the client itself against some of those attacks and then make it easy to recover from it. So yes, indeed, it, there is a threat. The chance of being impacted is pretty small, but if you're impacted, the, yeah, the, the, the result is pretty drastic. Yeah? We also have application agility with Kubernetes and stuff like that. So grow, land, expand and stuff like that. Um, we also can cope with that kind of uh, Hardware. But after we'll see afterwards in the uh, yeah the drawing. First, a little bit more about the numbers of theme. This is the marketing stuff, I would say. Yes, indeed, we're still in the Fortune 500, so we do serve at the bigger companies in the world. In fact, we are number one in EMEA for quite some time, and we are still two in worldwide. Once again, it's the wrong audience to mention it but all the partners in worldwide, or if you have worldwide customers, a lot of them are still stuck with the legacy programs because they're just used to it and then they just stick to it. So perhaps it's a good idea to, 
to yeah drop a message over there and say well did you ever hear about veeam already yes or no um well there are plenty of uh, reviews that are being done forester gardener we are pretty good situated over there uh, and over here another um small notion our headquarter for the moment is still in switzerland although we have been purchased by a holding actually from the us um, and that's about it for the marketing side. So our main strategy is still to have something that is pretty simple, pretty flexible. And why flexible? Well, we are just software and we are completely hardware agnostic. So we can jump around and do whatever we want. So there are partners over here that do only HPE, for instance, and the other ones are doing only Dell. Well, that's perfect. We work with both of them. Um, if you add another vendor, Supermicro or whatever, everything is possible so we are very flexible on that one we are still reliable and that's also being reflected in the numbers because we have plenty of customers that are uh, very happy with our software once they get to know uh, something about Veeam. clicking forward this is also the complete platform overview that can be used in a, as yeah for a sales deck for instance it can give an overview and will give you the the opportunity to use and talk about uh, their environment, so the customer's environment. Now let's jump into that famous whiteboard that you've all seen and the, the big mess. I can only ask if there are any questions. I instructed Thierry to uh, interrupt me instantly. So if there is a question, uh, pop it up uh, in the chat. I think there is a question chat and uh, a general chat. Um, use whatever you want. Um, Thierry will uh, interrupt me. I do not have a secondary screen uh, available to follow up. So Thierry will uh, um, do, do the, the moderating. Huh? Yeah. And then uh, we'll see uh, whether or not your question is being answered a little bit later on or uh, must be answered instantly. So feel free to interrupt me. We will start first with a customer. So this can be also be used if you're a salesperson or a little bit technical, it can be used and reused uh, at every customer. So you just put yourself in front of a whiteboard and you say, dear customer, what do you have running over there in your environment? You ask them, well, we have a data center. I'm also going to talk for about the bigger clients who have a secondary data center. Very likely they have some kind of a hypervisor. I'm going to just write hyper, yeah. any hypervisor. Why any? Well, I already mentioned we support VMware since the beginning. We added Hyper-V, we added Nutanix, and the Red Hat hypervisor is coming soon. Red Hat hypervisor, I don't see in big install base over here in Belgium, but it shall be mainly used by bigger service providers, I think, um, or just those who took the decision decision to to run on linux only for instance hypervisors of course that means we have running virtual machines i may hope so otherwise it's a, a spoiled license yeah it would be a pity a running virtual machines well that's a good thing already mentioned vmware hyper-v nutanix keep in mind this one has a little bit less features because of the, the Acropolis, certain features are simply not possible to do um, within that hypervisor, and very soon Red Hat hypervisors as well. Of course, this hypervisor, well, it has some storage. Yeah. Some enterprise storages, most of them we interact with a, some kind of a plugin and we can use it afterwards in the backup, in the, in the story of the backups. I will tell you about that a little bit later on. Most of those hypervisors are connected with some, yeah, if we talk about v, uh, VMware, for instance, we talk about a vCenter and they're being managed into different data centers and stuff like that. Yeah? Over here, well, we have virtual machines as well and you ask in the meanwhile you ask the client how many virtual machines do you have because that's the part that will become important afterwards for the licensing part yeah? and Thierry will tell about that licensing part the alternative over here is of course tell how many sockets do those hypervisors have yeah? this is 
the other type of licensing. No matter how many VMs are running on that socket, they are licensed, yeah? if the socket is licensed. Yeah? Over here, if there is storage, it is possible that those two are in sync. If the line in between data centers are okay-ish, I would say, yeah? there is a way to do that in sync. It can be in active sync, it can be in asynchronous sync. Um, different kinds of things are possible. What do, does a customer has as well? Very likely, it still has some big leftovers uh, of physical machines. Physical machines that are actually, uh, so this is a server with some disks and some CPU in it. Those need, still need to be backed up because they're still very important to back up. Yeah? So you write down and you write down the names or the amount, and then you get an overview on what to quote afterwards. Yeah? On the other hand, it might be important that, for instance, not all of the laptops and PCs yeah, are being backed up, but perhaps just those of the board just those at the production side, just those um, that are really piloting uh, the line, the production line uh, needs to be backed up to, to quickly recover from, for instance. Yeah? And this can be actually Windows, Linux, and Mac. So we do have also something for Mac. Yeah? Keep that in mind. Like, this is mainly the data center at the customer. So at this point in time, if you're doing some kind of a whiteboarding stuff, you know how many PCs that needs to be backed up. You know how many physicals, you know how many DCs are there in the world connected through V centers or multiple V centers, um, and they have some kind of a hypervisor. Now, there is something and that is being uh, added in, I think, uh, version 10, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah? It was being added and it was something called NAS backup. Yeah? NAS backup is also something very important. Why? Well, a lot of customers do have, for instance, a NetApp and they have big shares that needs to be backed up. Yeah? A Synology, uh, a QNAP, uh, whatever kind of a device or even a Windows file server, physical or virtual, that needs to be backed up on a NAS uh, way. NAS way, I would say, is always we take out the files and do actually a file by file backup and not a virtual machine backup or a complete entire backup. Yeah? So this is pretty important to know. Now, things, and uh, there we go. We're going to make some colors. Guess what? I'm taking Veeam as a green color. Yeah? Why green? Well, Veeam is all the way green in the logos as well. We have something called a VBR server. Yeah? VBR server actually can have multiple components. Pretty important for the more technical audience over here. Well, we have a VBR server. The VBR server for me is just a scheduler. Yeah? It's going to say, hey guys, it's 8 p.m. You need to start a backup job. Who is going to do the work? Well, it's being called a proxy. Yeah? But this one is again, is, is the guy who is actually going to consume CPU and memory. Can be physical, can be virtual. There are advantages to have things on virtual. There are advantages to have it on physical as well. Yeah? And the other role that is pretty important to know that exists is called a repository. What is a repository? Well, actually a repository is something that we can use to store data on it. So basically, if you have to take a look at it as a physical machine, then it's just a big physical server with plenty of disks, plenty of capacity to store our backups on it. So let's draw something like this. Over there, we have some space to um, put backups on. This can be placed on data center one. Another part, for instance, the repository part can be placed on data center two or perhaps even a third location. It will become visible why or what it will be. We also have something that is being called tape jobs. So we still support tape. Why tape? 
well, tape is actually pretty important in the ransomware and stuff like that. And it is the easiest way to have some kind of offline backups. There are plenty of alternatives, but the tape, once it's being written and being taken out of the robot, well, there you go. It's nearly impossible to destroy the tape unless you are in a very bad mood and you just destroy yourself the tape. Huh? There we go. So we're going to take a closer look at how backups are being taken. So you can inform the client as well. So what do we do? Well, actually on VMware, and then it's getting a little bit technical, we take some kind of a snapshot yeah? and we can work from snapshot over there. Imagine there is some kind of a supported storage device in between. We also take the snapshot on the storage. This means actually that this snapshot can be committed instantly and it's disappearing. And we take the backups from over here through our proxy, who is actually doing the work for us and dropping it in a repository. Repository, so over there we place our file. It's being called VBK file if it's a full, VIB files if it's incremental, and then off we go with the backup chain in there. Huh? Perhaps a little bit technical as well. Keep in mind, we do support on the Windows level, REFS, Resilient File System, which actually means if we take out a full backup and we draw a few increments and we take out a full backup again, we actually use this one to store the data and all these blocks on the Windows File Server are just pointers to the file system reflecting to blocks that are actually already written on the disk. So we do fast cloning and stuff like that. It's pretty important to know that it has performance. It, it, it does use something of the performance, but also it has just the, the space consumption of a more or less an incremental backup. Yeah? So you can make a lot of backup change actually um, and actually not consume so much uh, disk space or additional disk space. On the Linux part, because we also have a repository in the Linux part, it's using the same principle as REFS, only it's being called XFS. So that, that's about it. So nothing special over that. What can be done as well? NAS, because we take backups of NAS devices, well, actually, these backups are not being transformed to VBKs and VIBs, but actually are transformed to blobs. Yeah? Some kind of blobs, I think it's 64 megabytes, and it's being processed by a proxy and being dropped as well on the repository. Now, what about those physical machines? Well, on the physical machines, well, there is no choice. We have to push from VBR or manually install. It's a choice. I would suggest to use the, the pushing mechanism from VBR to push an agent on it, as well for the PCs. Yeah? All this on the virtual environment, please stress the fact that Basically, once you connect your VBR server to the vCenter and you do have sufficient access, you basically have to do nothing at all. All this process is being processed automatically. No agent installations are required and stuff like that. For the physical machines, agents do need to be installed. Yeah, And from time to time, indeed, if you process through the ES and the VBR level is going up, version 11, 12, 13, and so on, the agent need to be updated from time to time as well. So it involves a little bit of work, although from over here is just push and everything is being updated automatically. Watch out for the first in installation of this agent and for the technical guys. Uh, it's possible that some kind of a .NET component for the Windows machines needs to be installed as well. And there is some reboot pending. Yeah? Um, pretty important if we're talking about production machines. Um, now, what is so special about this repository? Because it's always coming back. Yeah? We can draw something around it and make it a logical, actually software-based and called sober. That means whatever you do, it's pointing to 
drop things on Sober. Whether you have now one repository or multiple, Sober will manage it. Scale out backup repository. So simply you can scale out or even scale down if it's uh, possible with the uh, retention um, to drop things over there. Another big advantage is, and that will come back later on, this can go to S3, S3 compatible or blob. Yeah. Funny thing about this one, S3 can be immuted. S3 compatible, not all of them can be immuted, but uh, can be made mute, immutable uh, storage. Blob is going to be uh, one day become immutable. Yeah, they're still working on it. It's not uh, the Veeam part that is missing, but actually the Microsoft part that is missing. So this is the part for the cloud, and as we'll come back later on. Yeah? Um, all right. Um, think for the VBR part. Oh, there we go. We're still missing one. So taking a backup is one thing. Pushing it up to a secondary location. So we have something called uh, Veeam 3 to 1 rule, which is basically the sales talk that you should have with your client. We can still do something like a backup copy job, which is actually moving the data from a backup file in a backup file towards a different location with a backup copy job. This one can be another location, but can also be for instance, and it's ideal for the VCSP part. It can be a repository being linked with a tenant dedicated to the client with a quota and stuff like that. Yeah? We also have, and then it becomes offline, a tape backup job. Pretty important for those that do have a hard requirement of tapes, for instance. Gary, in the meanwhile, somebody had a, a nice idea or a question? No question. We have a loophole <laughs> on Okay. So feel free to interrupt um, if you think that's better now. Um, no yeah. questions. No questions at this moment. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, maybe for the three to one rule, it's it's good to mention the Veeam Cloud Connect that uh, service providers can use also uh, to provide uh, an offsite backup repository to their uh, customers. Uh, to use. Yeah. But that's part of the non-reselling program, I would say. That's more for cloud providers. But uh, afterwards, we can talk about it uh, if some uh, partners in the call wants to talk about it. Yeah, sure. So I'll continue the process. So this, this was just about uh, the interaction that you could have with the client, but not, perhaps not mentioning XFS and REFS and extensions to the cloud yet. But this is mainly the the main story that we do um, at intake conversations with prospects. So talk about how does Veeam interact with and what can we do afterwards with those uh, additional backup copies and stuff like that. Interact with the um, backup jobs and so on and so on. I'm going to talk a little bit later on about other features about VBR, but linked to another product. But keep in mind, all the features, nearly all the features that I'm mentioning are basically already available in Veeam Backup and Replication with a traditional license. You know? I wanted to talk about one additional program. It's being called Veeam One. It's also part of Veeam, uh, of our uh, portfolio, I would say, uh, in a nice way. And Veeam 1, actually, why did they make the name Veeam 1? Because initially, it was being composed out of multiple products that they bundled into one component, and they were searching for a name. So somebody has said, well, it's now one product, so let's make it Veeam 1. Surprise, surprise, Veeam 1 was born. Yeah? This one is actually doing a, a multitude of uh, tasks. And basically one of the tasks is monitoring and alerting. Yeah? 
this one is actually the one that has been perfectly translated by a customer of mine. And he's saying, well, Veeam 1, for him, it was somebody, actually a full-time equivalent, but then based on 24, 24, 7 on 7, that is ready to start shouting if something goes wrong. Yeah? And how does it do that? Well, actually, it's being connected to Veeam backup and replication. So if something goes wrong with a backup job, Veeam 1 is the one who knows it. Yeah? It's also connected to the virtual environment. So if something goes wrong on the virtual environment, well, Veeam 1 does know. Yeah? What could go wrong? Something on the host goes wrong. Yeah? Too much CPU consumption, too much memory, um, running out of storage. Yeah? That is something that Veeam 1 is going to detect. Yeah? This is the one who is actually monitoring everything for you. Yeah? It's not only limiting to the hypervisor, but also taking a look at the virtual machines as well. And since quite some versions, we are also looking into the virtual machines. So for instance, you can define Beam 1 to monitor a process of a database. Yeah? From the moment the process stops, hangs, or is getting killed, it instantly warns yeah, the administrator by an email or it starts popping up um, some alerts and stuff like that. So this is the one who is there to monitor the environment. Now, it's a very good tool, but a lot of people just install it and then they just say, well, it's generating too many alerts. Yeah? That's because you did not fine tune. Yeah? We have some defaults preset into Veeam 1. A very good example, Veeam 1 was being installed in, uh, in an environment. I'm not going to name the client. Uh, it was being installed in a, in a general environment, but once a month, it was configured also to stop services. Yeah, so it's allowed Veeam 1, you can instruct Veeam 1 to stop certain services. It was a ransomware alert that is being built in into Veeam 1 and it popped up the, the alert. It was longer than, I think it was 15 seconds active. So it's initiated to shut down the machine. Yeah. Funny story beside, it was actually an SQL server that was consuming a lot of CPU and consuming a lot of IO. That combination is actually the ransomware alert. Yeah? But it was once a month, every time I would say towards the end of the month, it was doing that thing and it was shutting down that SQL server. Um, the problem was it was actually doing the payroll. So it was calculating the payrolls of the people. So it was generating a lot of CPU and a lot of memory and a lot of uh, IOs on the disk. So if you do not fine tune or make an exception on that certain SQL server, well, basically you're going to have wrong alerts. Yeah? And that is a pity because the, the tool itself, it works perfectly. Yeah? What can you do with it as well? And then it becomes quite handy. Make some categories. Yeah? For instance, you can make a category exclusion ransomwares yeah? for that SQL server, the example that I've been made. And we also do some reporting. Reporting, for me, this part is actually reactive. Yeah? Something goes wrong and someone afterwards needs to do something. Yeah? The reporting is oops, proactive. Active. Yeah? So this is the one who is going to make some nice reports telling you your storage consumption is suddenly going up and you will be running out of storage in, for instance, 60 days. So it's already too, la too late to start buying new hardware huh, with the current uh, delivery date, but it is quite some time to clean up stuff to have at least the time to buy in some new hardware. So for instance, this is just a report. Uh, it is in there to monitor your storage. 
is also monitoring the storage of your backups because people from time to time they launch new projects and it consumes all of a sudden more storage uh, in the backups as well yeah? so keep that in mind this is actually the uh, proactive part you can interact with problems before they're actually uh, happening there is a very cool thing and that I really suggest to activate. It's called diagnostics. It's even called intelligent diagnostic. This one is downloading signatures from the Veeam website. So it's going to down, download signatures just like antivirus scans. Yeah? The downloading signatures, certain signatures do match with your environment for instance you have a vcenter on version I, I don't know you have a vbr server on version i don't know and you have a repository for instance a store ones with firmware version that type you might run into a very specific problem so watch out so this one is going to warn you as well up front before you actually have an issue where do those um signatures come from well actually somebody who opened a case at veeam it was being redirected to for instance if i'm use the the example of a store once uh, it was being redirected with, with hpe there is a special fix for the uh, store ones to resolve the issue well this one will also appear in the signatures of our veeam one and then with the combination of vCenter version, VBR's version, and the store ones in a certain version of firmware, it will pop up as a warning. And you can pre-install that fix already before having an issue or having corrupted data or whatever. Yeah? So this is pretty cool. Uh, I think it's really worth it. Just a few checkboxes to activate it. The downside of this one, well, actually it needs to have internet access. Yeah? But that's that's uh, yeah that's something that you have to take with and it makes sense you can download manually as well and import it but that's uh, as we are all administrators and that are lazy i don't think uh, it would cause an issue actually i already warned Thierry about it yesterday that i was going to forget it i was almost forgotten it we also yeah. have yeah we also have something called management pack. Um, that one is the equivalent actually of a Veeam one. It's still, it's still being developed. It's not, uh, not a lot of new customers buy this, uh, the management pack, because most are uh, directing to Veeam one. Um, I'm not going to lie, the, the Veeam one part is nicer than the management pack, but a lot of big customers still have management pack and they're sticking to it. Yeah? Jerry, any questions in the meanwhile? Because this one ends another product of Veeam. Uh, no. Uh, or everyone is just, yeah, overblasted, overwhelmed with the product overview, or it's so clear that uh, there are no questions. Okay. I'll, I'll just continue now. Uh, keep in mind the next product and it can be announced even at sales level if you're talking about uh, to a customer. The next product on the technical part, I would say is the most complicated product. Yeah? On a sales perspective, it's very easy. Yeah? You just say, well, Veeam has something for you that can manage your Veeam disaster recovery and orchestrate everything. Well, basically, if you use those words, you actually mentioned already Veeam disaster recovery orchestrators, yeah, which used to be actually Veeam availability orchestrator, which was the equivalent of keeping things available. Yeah. Now they're more focusing on the disaster recovery, of course. Veeam disaster recovery on a sales perspective, very easy to explain. On technical perspective for the consultant, for instance, to implement it and to fine tune everything, it can be um more difficult because you have to know everything this one involves on a tech part you have to know the environment of the customer you have to know the network of the customer you have to know the hypervisor and stuff like that uh, everything on the customer you have to know nearly everything on the storage perspective 
So it's getting quite complicated, yeah? And if things are not yet difficult enough, you have the requirements of the customer itself, the RTO, RPO, and stuff like that, that you have to implement into it. So it can quickly become one big giant spider web uh, of requirements that have to be linked together. However, on sales perspective, you can still say, well, beam disaster recovery, well, they can make it happen to make the link between those virtual machines on the left and on the right. Uh, yeah, it's the opposite way, on the left and on the right. Yeah. Things can be synced together, once again, with the default functions within PBR, you know, can be synced within a replica job or CDP, which is continuous data protection, which is near synchronous, um, yeah, replication, I would say, but replication is the wrong word to use over there. Or if you have a NetApp, a sync of the two storages that can be resynced together and managed by Veeam Disaster Recovery. How does it do that? Well, actually, we make the link to Veeam Backup and Replication, and we make the link to DC1, and we make the link to DC2 as well. And like this, we can manage the environments. Now, the funny thing is about VDRO, once again, this is really important from a sales perspective. It does generate all the required documentation. So from the moment a system administrator generates over here a new virtual machine, it tags it because tags in VMware are required. It tags it with, for instance, gold. That means automatically it's being encapsulated by VBR in the backup jobs. Yeah? So it's being backed up and perhaps back it copied toward another location. It's being automatically being caught by the replica or the CDP. So it will have a duplicate <clears throat> over here. So I would say virtual machine accent. Yeah? And the next day, it will have everything in the documentation that this machine is actually being brought at the other side and that it is being ready to spin up. It's not being tested yet. However, you could use Veeam Disaster Recovery to make some kind of an isolated environment and spin up virtual machines in order to test the RTO RPO. And actually this one is already being checked. And if it's validated, it is also being validated in the documentation. So it's, uh, it will say if the RTO, for instance, is, I would say 20 minutes and after your check, you, you'll see that it's actually 17 minutes. So within time, well, actually it's being documented that the RTO has been met. Now, the funny thing, if it's not being met, so big cross over here, then the administrator knows the next day that he has some work to do because this is just a check. Huh? It's not a real disaster recovery. So he needs to do something to make it work again. Yeah? And that can be nearly anything. But keep that in mind, VDRO normally does most of the thing for you. So it, it you will need to know more or less everything of the customer's environment, but it can manage everything uh, afterwards. And if everything is being defined pretty well, well, there is actually a play button in VDRO. And if something goes wrong, you click on the play button and off you go. Everything is being disaster recovered towards, I would say the left side or the right side, it doesn't matter. Um, Thierry, still nothing? I think he was muted. Yeah, I'm, I'm still muted. No, uh, everything is quiet in the chat, uh, so. Or the chat is not working. Uh, um, <laughs> okay. I'm not sure. <laughs> 
let's check as well over here. Let's talk a little bit more of the cloud, yeah, the big famous cloud on the right side. We have another product. I have a confirmation from Rani that the chat is working. Ah, uh, great. So, um, I'm going to make this a little bit smaller. Voila. Then I can draw over here as well because I'm, I'm seeing all the faces. Yeah. There is something people usually say in Azure, but it's it's under discussion whether it, whether or not it's Azure. But there is something in the cloud of Microsoft. Let's, let's make a summary of, of, of it like that. Called Office 365. And Office 365 has multiple components. You know? It has mail. SharePoint, OneDrive, which is basically more or less the same as the SharePoint part. And then you got Teams, which is basically the combination of all those things. And there are multiple other smaller applications in the Office 365 cloud, I would say. Yeah. Um, these are the main components, I would say. Um, and well, people, do not always know. So if you go to a client, people do not always know that they actually signed the service license agreement with Microsoft. And there is a small note. I think it's the last paragraph. Uh, I think the, the second last um, sentence is being mentioned simply, you need to regularly back up your uh, data because Office 365, Microsoft is foreseeing the infrastructure, but the data itself is being managed by the client itself. So the client itself is responsible for the data. So these things need to be backed up. Now, there are multiple possibilities on doing that. And we have a product called VBO. VBO can actually be installed full on-prem, full cloud, or partially. Yeah? That's why I usually make something like this. Yeah, square box and a partial cloud. Yeah. So it's backing up the data is actually being done by API calls. So we're completely depending on API calls of Microsoft. Yeah. And we're downloading that data. First, biggest worry of a client is well, we're downloading that data, so we have to pay for it because it's going out of the cloud. Well, that's wrong completely because Office 365 is a service. And this service is being paid by user, regardless the outgoing traffic. Yeah? Otherwise, a user, if we take the example of the email, a user would be punished if it downloads one time the email on his laptop, another, to, another time on his um, smart uh, watch, a smart phone, uh, smart whatever. Yeah? And afterwards in the evening on his iPad as well, or on its own local desktop uh, at home. So it, regardless the amount of emails he is downloading, it's not being reflected in the payoff. So it, this is just a user-based license. And because of this, this is a user-based license. Well, actually it's being reflected as well over here in VBO. It's also a user-based license. So in general, what do we say? Well, it's more or less a one-on-one -on -one mapping. If you have thousand users in Office 365, you will have thousand users in Team Backup and uh, for Office 365. We need to download some data. Well, there is a throttling mechanism of Microsoft itself. We know pretty good how to handle those and avoid it. So we download everything and put it on disk. That is if it is entirely on premises, or we can do something like temporary disk, which is called a cache, and then upload it to S3 blob or S3 compatible. Keep in mind, this one is not being foreseen yet to have immutable backups. Yeah? So this is by Veeam Backup for Office 365. And I think pops up already, Thierry. Uh, what did you say, uh, Stan? I didn't get it. 
is there is there anything uh, popping up already from questions? Uh, yeah, there was one question, but it was about recording, so I just uh, okay. answered it in the chat. Uh, so uh, no uh, no questions about your work. It's still fine. Okay. So another. Let's jump into the next tool, which is also cloud. In fact, yeah. We already been talking about this thing. Yeah, backups can be transported to the cloud. Yeah, it's being transported to a bucket. I would say, I'm going to make the example or the the drawing about um, Amazon or Amazon compatible storage over here, and the blobs over here. Yeah. The rest of the, the thing that I'm going to say is actually the same for Beam Backup for Azure, Beam Backup for AWS, or Google Cloud Protect. So no, it's not Beam Backup, no, it's just GCP. No? Um, so we indeed support Google as well. So now those backups, they reside now in the cloud. Well, actually the funny thing about it is in a disaster recovery perspective, you can do a local restore of virtual machines. This is also something that a lot of clients do not know. Um, in a disaster recovery, you lose your complete DC1, complete DC2, they're encrypted or whatever. You do have some data of yesterday or two days ago, whatever, in a bucket somewhere in the cloud install a small Veeam backup and replication, link to it, and off you go. You can start restoring locally uh, in the cloud. I'm pretty convinced that if you restore just as is, it will cost a lot of yeah, running costs in Azure or in AWS and stuff like that, but at least it is a disaster recovery uh, that can be done. So if a client does not have a secondary data center, this might be a perfect alternative. Now, why do we have products like Azure, AWS, and Google Cloud Protect? Well, by default, they do have some snapshotting mechanism, but we do have a little bit more than just the snapshotting mechanism. Yeah? We can snapshot and transfer those things as a backup into a bucket and or into blob. Yeah? We can synchronize and do fancy tough stuff with other buckets, for instance. There are plenty of options. The good thing about those products is because it's cloud and actually does not cost any additional thing on Veeam, on the usage over here, but it's usage on cloud. And usage on cloud means, well, actually you have to pay for it. Yeah. So at the end of the um, configuration of your backup policy, you will have the opportunity to check how much would this cost if I do the backup job? How much would it cost if I activate a synchronization on a different uh, territory as well? How much would it cost and stuff like that? So you basically see the overview and you can configure whatever you want in between $1 up to thousands of dollars uh, of a backup policy. So everything is possible, but you will at least have an estimation upfront how much it would cost. Now, the funny thing about those backups that are being backed up into a repository, we have something as well in Veeam Backup and Repl Replication. It's being called external repository. Yeah. And this external repository can be linked again to this one. Yeah. So with the backups of the cloud. With the backups of the cloud, the good thing about it, well, you can do some copy. So bring back the data. So this is egress, this will cost something. Yeah, You can do some copy. You can do even a restore or even a instant virtual machine recovery. Yeah, Which means that a virtual machine that was running, I would say 10 seconds ago in the cloud, you can restore now back on-prem. So in a disaster recovery situation, this would be the way back, for instance. Yeah? 
so far the uh, VBA, A, and GCP. Uh, anything pops up? Still nothing, I guess. Nope, no, no questions. Now let's zoom in for the partners that has have massive customers. They usually are still stuck with something that we call enterprise. Enterprise plugins. Enterprise plugins. There you go. What are those things like, for instance, Subhana plugin? Things like the Oracle Arman plugin, things like the AIX uh, components, agents, and stuff like that. So those components as well, they can interact with a Veeam backup application, make backups on the Veeam repositories, and make your life easier. Yeah? The best example in this case is, for instance, an Oracle Arman. What are they used to do? The Oracle DBAs normally make dumps into a NAS, and then the IT is being asked to back up that NAS into something in the uh, backup and replication. The annoying thing, if something goes wrong on, with the device itself, well, actually, you have to restore things on the NAS. The DBA needs to be restoring from the NAS into the application and then play back. Um, logs, for instance, on the application itself. While only if it was installing that Arman plugin or agent of AIX and stuff like that, it resides directly over here. Veeam One is completely aware that retention policy has been met, for instance. It, it monitors as well the, the uh, environment, so the repository. Your NAS is not required anymore. Um, and in case of an uh, Arman, for instance, both the uh, administrator of the database and the administrator of the backups could potentially replay the logs into the application. So plenty of things are possible with those enterprise plugins. They're really dedicated. So if you have a massive client with dedicated stuff in his environment, we can always, as a Veeam engineer, we can always call in uh, the help of an architect which has dedicated knowledge on that plugin, for instance. Yeah? And we have a roadmap question. Okay. Um, the question is um, when. The answer. Let's go ahead with the question. When would it be possible to manage products on prem? Cloud and Office 365 backup, for instance, from a single Veeam management console perspective? Very good question. On the VBO part, I think this is not going to be integrated in the VBR part. But all the rest, the VBR part, actually, if you install the, there is a little patch, for instance, for the cloud part. Well, actually, that, that is already being integrated. But because if you install that little patch, you can orchestrate VBR and tell them to install completely the VBA, for instance, and start backing up those components. So there is already integration. But keep in mind, these components, they have a different life cycle as this one. So matching completely is difficult, I would say, and will always be done with or small updates dedicated for, for instance, Azure, uh, AWS, and Google. Yeah. And I think for now, I think the Google part is not being integrated in VBR. But anyhow, it will be still a challenge for me to find the first Google Cloud protected client in Belgium because uh, we don't see Google Cloud a lot in, in Belgium. Yeah, very popular in the States, for instance, but not over here. Same for AWS. AWS is adopted in Belgium, but not on the same level as Azure. While in the US, we see the opposite. AWS is booming and Azure, but well, it's basically not being used. <laughs> so the roadmap as well, I will tell you a little secret about Veeam. The roadmap is, is pretty annoying for me as an AZ. Um, why? There are dedicated people, product managers, that do know the roadmap. 
and only a few weeks be before they come out with a new update, a full update, I would say, um, they will gather the whole team together of the Aziz and will tell the new features and the know-how and how does it function and stuff like that. So by default, we know, for instance, there is a new version coming, version 12, but we do not have all the insight of all the features. So it can be tr three features or 30 or 300 features. I would not have a clue. Yeah? So that's the funny thing about Veeam. It is both very frustrating, but also it's also to protect ourselves from ourselves because we are, will not be able to promote features that are not there yet. And so people, yeah, they, they don't get false expectations. Yeah? Apart from the, the roadmap question, something else? <laughs> no, we get a, for the answer, you get already a, a big thanks, but uh, yeah. no other questions at this moment. No, so it is quite frustrating as a partner as well. So from time to time, they, they give the tendency to make an exception. <clears throat> so we can ask to a dedicated product manager because if there are rumors, huh? of a, a certain feature and the client is waiting for a certain feature, we can have some kind of a, um, approval flow that has to be launched um, in order to have a dedicated person under NDA, everything can be explained, but it's always with a little warning, like it's potentially that it cannot make the GA huh? because things might reflect in beta testing or uh, alpha testing and that it's just simply undoable, for instance. That little thing over here, for instance, NAS, uh, is a perfect example of it. It used to be in version 10 and then it was postponed in um, version... No, it used to be in version... Yeah, it used to be um, ready in uh, version 10, but they just discovered some uh, pretty annoying bugs into it just before uh, it went out. So it was actually postponed to um, the next version. Now let's jump a little bit further on. We have some smaller pillar. Kubernetes, and I will do the same thing because you can use Kubernetes in the cloud as well. Yeah. It's being commonly be referred as AKS in Azure, uh, Azure, um, but can run perfectly on-prem uh, also if you have a dedicated environment. So it's easy to, well, actually, if you, it's not easy because if you pull out certain services on the current environment, so virtual machines, for instance, you divide them in microservices and you put them into Kubernetes, for instance, um, then actually we can start uh, working on that one because we have a product called Custom, which is also available in, by the way, in the marketplace in Azure, if I'm not mistaken for the AKS part. Um, and Custom, we actually bought the company to interact with the Kubernetes. We were thinking of doing ourselves something with Kubernetes. Um, and then eventually custom was the market becoming or actually already the market leader uh, of Kubernetes backup. And we actually just bought them because it's stupid to do the same job twice because they were having a, a fairly good approach. Also over here, uh, I guess the question will pop up again. Uh, will there be interaction? Yeah, I guess there will be interaction, but not at this version yet. So I think we looped over all the products. What I'm willing to stress out one little thing, and it's actually for the tech people and the sales people. If you have over here Veeam Backup and Replication, which is running in Data Center 1, and you have a Backup and Replication in Data Center 2, and you have a remote site, for instance, where you have Veeam backup and replication as well. No, there is no separate license to use something like 
enterprise managers. I have no clue where that story is coming from that an enterprise manager, which is basically only a web portal of managing multiple VBR servers together, yeah? doing role-based access, granting end users the possibility to do file, file level restores and stuff like that. Yeah? This is being used as an enterprise manager. And no, it does not have a separate license. You can use it. Yeah? The only downside with our software is you can install as many Veeam backup and replication service as you would like, but you can only install one enterprise manager. Yeah? Okay. I can't see any questions coming in, Stan. Uh, so. I see uh, a chat that is not moving. No. Okay. So if there is anything, feel free to drop a, a question uh, in the chat. I can still reply afterwards uh, if Thierry is doing his presentation. Okay, uh, so let's keep this one. I will stop the sharings. Yeah, if you want. Voila, there you go. Uh, okay. So after we had the overview of, uh, of the products, uh, a little bit about our licensing, uh, the main focus for Veeam is on Veeam universal licenses. So uh, we'll see that not all products, but let's say 90% of the products of Veeam, uh, the backup solution uh, is, um, is available uh, through Veeam universal licenses. We do still have uh, perpetual licenses uh, with a per socket uh, model, uh, but that's, let's say, is an ending story. Um, uh, we'll see that uh, you can still buy Veeam backup application, Veeam availability suite, and the Veeam essentials uh, bundle socket-based, so uh, based on the number of CPUs in your hypervisors uh, for VMware and Hyper-V. Um, but uh, we'll see that that will be an ending story. Everything will be moved to universal licenses, Veeam universal licenses. Already since the beginning of this year, uh, you're limited in your choices um, with uh, the perpetual per socket model. New customers for Veeam, uh, so people who buy their first Veeam licenses for Veeam backup replication, Veeam availability suite, and essential. Well, essential is not for Veeam backup replication, Veeam availability suite are limited to the Enterprise Plus, so the highest edition with professional support, which is in meaning of features identical to the universal license. So if you buy a universal license and you look at the feature set of the products uh, for Hyper-V and, and, and VMware, uh, you'll see that they are always at the enterprise plus level with protection support. Essential is the only exception there. If you buy uh, uh, CPU licenses, you still have a choice between standard enterprise and enterprise plus, but that's the small VSMB product, uh, which is limited to six CPUs. For all other licenses, Veeam is focusing on the Veeam universal licenses. Um, first of all, first, the, the main reason is that almost every uh, software vendor is moving to a subscription-based, consumption-based licensing model. Uh, so you're no, no longer buying the product, but simply take a subscription, which is easy to downsize or upsize uh, when necessary. Uh, and if you don't use them or well, the subscription simply ends. So the upfront cost of getting a subscription is uh, quite easy. Also, we see a move from, from on-prem to cloud and sometimes back to on-prem. 
uh, and, and people have physical computers who disappear and we get more VMs in the cloud, for instance. So there, with perpetual licensing, there is not, not a great flexibility. With the full licensing model from Veeam, uh, you simply have an instance, a license for an instance. And uh, if you use it this month for, let's say, backup of a physical workstation or a server, physical server, and next month you virtualize that physical server, well, you can simply reuse your license from your physical machine for your virtual machine. And if within two months you move that virtual machine to the cloud, well, you simply use your license for the VM you had for your cloud instance. So it's 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 a flexible uh, way of licensing, and it's uh, it moves with your use cases. Uh, let's say so. It's a little bit what uh, I said. Um, so every product, uh, it's just a universal license. So if you, it would be for backing up a physical workstation server, uh, for apps, for virtual workloads on, on Nutanix, uh, Hyper-V or, or vSphere, or your cloud workloads, you all can use a Veeam universal license. At this moment, I know on the slide there is also mentioning uh, of Office 365 backup, but that's not integrated in Veeam Universal License at this moment. Um, so the, the, the three products I already talked about. So you can't buy a workstation license uh, or uh, an, an agent uh, license. Uh, you need to buy Veeam Universal licenses for one of the three major products, Veeam Backup Replication, Veeam Availability Suite, or the Veeam Essentials. Veeam Availability Suite and Veeam Backup Essentials are, in fact, just the same as a Veeam Backup Replication, but it's a bundling. So if you buy Veeam Availability Suite or the Veeam Backup Essentials, you're buying Veeam Backup Replication together with uh, Veeam One. Uh, it's a subscription model, so you pay from one year to five years maximum at once. Uh, and it's with full, it's always enterprise plus level features uh, with production support. Um, backup replication and Veeam availability suite are sold in bundles of 10 instances. They grow with 10 instances. Uh, Veeam backup essentials is sold in packs of five minimum, with a maximum of 50 uh, for uh, Veeam backup essentials. With Veeam backup replication, Veeam availability suite, there is no upper limit. How is your consumption uh, calculated or which workload will use how many licenses? Well, it's quite easy. All workloads use one license. So if it be a local VM or a cloud VM or a physical server uh, or an application server, Oracle or SAP uh, or um, workstation, but the workstations is just a small, little bit difference. Uh, for one license, you can back up three workstations. Uh, Stan talked about the uh, NAS backup. Um, there, it's for each 500 gigabytes of backed up data, uh, it's, uh, it's one license. Uh, for the NAS backup, I want to mention there are also NAS capacity packs. Um, that's for the higher volumes. Uh, so if you have a, a very big NAS, uh, it will be cheaper to work with the uh, capacity packs, uh, but we have to look at that uh, at the moment of quoting. And also, especially to essentials uh, customers, uh, there is another advantage. If you use capacity packs, you don't use any more uh, a Veeam universal license for um, that NAS backup. So you can use the NAS capacity packs aside from your VIL licensing. So you can still have 50 instances just for backing up instances. So workstations, uh, VMs, and that. Well, your NAS capacity packs will only be used for um, NAS backups at that moment. Yeah. I'm going to interrupt. Go back one one slide, Jerry. Yeah. yeah. Again, about the NAS files backup, uh, I would mention also your old partners, if customers are still sticking to version 9.5 update 4, for instance, or version 10, keep in mind that a one single NAS 
license, so VUL, is licensed per slot of 250 gigabytes. So they have all the advantages if they move towards version 11, because all of a sudden they can get, for the same licensing perspective, they can double of the, the size to back. Thank you, Sam. Um, so differences uh, between features uh, of full and uh, as a socket. Uh, so if you have socket licenses, perpetual, uh, and you want uh, continuous data protection, for instance, that's only a feature for the enterprise plus model. So you need to make sure if you're using a CPU model and uh, that you're on the highest level. Archive tier is also enterprise plus. Hardened repo is available for all uh, CPU licenses. Uh, NAS, SKU, SQL and Oracle uh, instant recovery. Um, not instant recovery is not available uh, in the CPU model. Uh, instant recovery for SQL and Oracle from the enterprise edition, um, Hyper-V in all versions. Uh, the agent for Mac is, all agents are just as available in the VO licensing, so not in sockets. Uh, and the restful APIs are also available from uh, the highest edition on. There are three main products that are not available at this moment to Veeam Universal license. Of course, Veeam Backup for Office 365. Uh, there it's a per user license model. Uh, it's also a subscription model, so as flexible as, as it both licenses, but there it's just a different pricing and a different uh, metric uh, per user. Veeam Disaster Recovery Orchestrator, uh, which is per orchestrated instance, but in the next slide, uh, a few more words about this uh, orchestrator. Now, of course, the management pack, uh, a hidden gem from, uh, as a product uh, from Veeam, uh, which is available as a separate product and also per socket based in a subscription model. For the Disaster Recovery Orchestrator, there are two ways to buy it. Uh, you can buy it simply standalone, uh, you buy 10 packs of uh, uh, yeah, orchestrated VMs. Um, and then you pay, it's, it's dollar prices here, but for a pack of 10 uh, orchestrated VMs, you will pay something around uh, 1,550 uh, US dollar. Uh, but there is another way uh, to buy it. And that's with a DR pack. Um, the difference is it's, it's cheaper, but you have to license all your VMs. So even if you have some VMs that you do not want to orchestrate, in fact, it should be equal to your full licensing um, there. And it's cheaper. It's only 310 uh, US dollar per year for 10 licenses. Uh, but there is a difference with the standalone. You only select or you buy a license for the, the VMs you want to orchestrate. Uh, and with the DR pack, you need to license all your VMs. Uh, but it's it's cheaper, uh, I think. Something I rarely see uh, a demand for, uh, but it's available if you really have a big customer who doesn't like subscriptions. At this moment, we also have a full perpetual. Same licensing model, uh, so same counts of instances, uh, but you simply buy the instances as, uh, yeah the same way like you would buy socket license. So it's a vote perpetual with then, of course, uh, renewals to do every year or uh, after your uh, support ends uh, to stay uh, covered by support or updates for the product. But it's, I never sold, sold it uh, in Belgium either. Uh, so. Resources and support for um, for VOL licensing, I would say uh, visit the Veeam IQ. There are quite a few, uh, so on the, you log into the partner uh, uh, portal. And there on Veeam IQ, you get a, a few uh, trainings, let's say, uh, about uh, Veeam universal licenses. Uh, there is also the VSP courses available there, uh, which gives you some more sales knowledge uh, or pre-sales knowledge with the VTSP uh, trainings uh, available on Veeam IQ. Uh, there is a separate page um, 
There is a Veeam universal licensing toolkit available on the ProPartner and their sales uh, resources uh, with um, the licensing policies, migration policies, and uh, a few words later on that. Uh, there is also on uh, the ProPartner portal uh, a code building tool uh, where you can easily uh, build a code uh, with the SKUs. You will get the SKUs. Uh, and then, or you go to our software store or you send us a small email, our details later also, uh, you can simply quote for your customers. Uh, and of course, uh, for certain quotes, uh, we have even, we have to ask Veeam for a quote. And then I'm mainly referring to uh, migration quotes. So if you have customers still on sockets, uh, it's getting, yeah, it's getting to the end of life cycles, I would say. Uh, it's an ending story, uh, the Veeam CPU uh, model. Um, so it's getting time to migrate their customers away from the CPU model to a, a subscription model. Um, for this, just send us a, a, a request by email, uh, preferable, with the end customer details. Uh, his contract he has and uh, which conversion ratio he would like. Uh, so if he has more than seven VMs per physical CPU, uh, we will need to have the log files from your VBR installation. If it's below, it's not necessary. It will be on the discretion of Veeam uh, sales team to ask for it. Um, they will make a quote for the migration from sockets to Veeam universal licenses. Um, on a first view in point of pricing, it will be almost the same price as buying new VIL licenses. But the sales argument here is that the customer, the end user, will get uh, for a lifetime for, or as long as he keeps those migrated VIL licenses alive, I would say, he will get a reduction uh, on his renewals. So the migrated Veeam universal licenses you get will be at the next renewal, depending on the conversion ratios and so on, but it, it will be the Veeam team, uh, Veeam sales team who will uh, yeah, uh, give it uh, the, the reduction, uh, but it can go up to 70% reduction on Veeam renewal uh, for migrated uh, full licenses. So uh, it's quite uh, high renewal reductions there for people who migrate to, to vote from CPUs. Of course, uh, every customer who bought a subscription or, or perpetual license has access to his licensing portal uh, where he can simply open uh, a case for any uh, questions, technical support, or even licensing questions uh, can be asked also there. Our contact uh, details. Uh, so if you have a question about uh, Veeam software, uh, just send a mail to tdas underscore software at bigdata.be uh, or simply give us a call on 02583831010. Uh, and that's it for VOL licensing. I'm not sure if there are any questions on the chat for the licensing part. Nope, I think uh, up to now uh, it was pretty clear. Uh, also me as a system engineer, I don't touch licenses, I would say, but even I understood it. So I think it was crystal clear. <laughs> Thank you. Do we get an OP from Joey? Sure, do you want to uh, no, uh, if there are no questions, I think we can uh, finish here. Thanks, uh, Thierry and Sam, for the session. And thanks to all the partners for being here. And uh, yes, please expect my email in a couple of days um, with a link to the recording. And of course, if you have questions, please let us know. Okay.
thank you everyone for uh, attending and uh, yeah keep uh, an eye on your mailbox because there will be i think for the last quarter another veeam uh, partner academy subject still to be determined so if you have suggestions send us an email uh, we can always uh, use some suggestions for uh, completing the agenda and also keep your eye on the mailbox from veeam i think they still have some announcements to make Okay. No. Is the recording stopped? Not yet. No. <laughs> no.